Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guests, I just want to give a shout out to my sponsors at Blue Chew. If you are lacking confidence in the bedroom, you want to give Blue Chew a try. You can try it for free with my code Holly. Just pay $5 in shipping. Go to bluechew.com, use code Holly to try it for free. Just pay $5 in shipping. My guest today is a three-time AVN Award nominee who moved to America earlier this year after working as a performer and a veterinarian in Australia for several years. Welcome, Charlie Ford. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Good. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, no, it's lovely to have you. Well, especially because when I was first entering porn, I don't know if you remember this, but I... Uh, wanted to contact people that I looked up to in the industry. Mm. And you were one of three people. It was Brie Mills, Jackie St. James and yourself that I emailed. Aww. And you responded, which was really um, precious to me because I was nobody and you gave me your time and you gave me a lot of your time and you gave me a lot of useful information. Oh. So I've been very excited to meet you for a very Aww, long time. Thank you. I do remember you writing to me. I don't remember what I said. But I'm sure it was brilliant it was and life altering yes. and profound <laughs> and you owe everything to me. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Podcast interviews over. We can't top that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean you just you just came here what, like six months ago? Uh, just under about five months ago, yeah. So how it's, has the transition been? It's been a lot. Um there's a lot of things different in America and the industry as well is just entirely different. And I was semi-prepared for the culture shock. So when I signed under Spiegler and I was coming over here, I reached out to Angela by email because, well, and Savannah as well, actually. I wanted to talk to my fellow Aussies and mm -hmm. get their opinion on what I needed to be prepared for. And Angela gave me a lot of excellent advice. And I so I was prepared for credit history and I was prepared for difficulties with apartments and you know, trouble getting car loans, but it's one thing to know it and another thing to live it. Mm. So it was a very big shock. Yeah. To say the least. But I'm finally starting to settle now. So what what kind of difficulties did you have? I'm assuming like you didn't have a credit history in the US. Was that like your big issue? Yeah. So they don't accept Australian income. So even though I could show income from Australia, that meant nothing. Mm -hmm. So I had to work for three to four months to prove income so that I could then be able to get an apartment. Mm -hmm. Still to this day, I can't get a car loan under 30%. Mm. It's insanity. Wow. Um, but it'll happen eventually. Yeah. Yeah. It's just slowly, slowly. America is a very difficult country to Australia. immigrate to. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, they definitely make it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I think that they, you know, like everything they can do to keep like people out. It's yeah. just crazy. Well, and then even like take aside all of the stuff with moving to America itself, but coming onto sets as large as what are in America and the types of companies that are here and navigating that was also mm. like a wild experience as well because it's very different to Australia. So tell me what are like some of the biggest differences between – actually, you know what? Let's start from the beginning. Okay. Let's start with how you got into the industry. Then I think that will naturally kind of lead into what the industry is like in Australia and then the differences when you came here. Yeah, sure. So I was finishing up being a veterinary student mm -hmm. um, and I – I had a friend that was in the industry in Australia. She had shot internationally and she said, you should think about doing this. And at the time I was very nervous, like for, for obvious reasons, you know, mm -hmm. like it's a very permanent decision and I was graduating to be a doctor and I didn't know how that would affect my ability to be a doctor if people found out. So I went away for a year and kind of sat with it as a mm -hmm. decision and did some research and obviously I came out thinking – Oh, well, fuck it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> other people's opinions are other people's opinions. And I'm glad that I made that decision, but it was a big deal for me at the time, especially because when I was growing up, I, you know, I hear a lot of porn performers talk often in podcasts about how they were extremely sexual prior to entering porn and it was their way of exploration. And for me, it couldn't have been further from the truth. Hmm. I was very socially awkward. I couldn't talk to strangers and boys and like even older men that were just like you know friends of the family and stuff I struggled with all of that until probably at least 24 and so for me it was a big learning curve just to navigate being a social person let alone being sexual with people and exploring that so yeah I had almost like the opposite so that's so interesting because I know that a lot of people's first question is going to be well if you were on track to be you know a veterinarian which is a very difficult and, you know, supposedly well-paying job. Why would you throw that all away to be in the adult industry, especially if you weren't like a naturally sexual person? Well, 
for me, it was a method of expression that I hadn't had the opportunity to have yet. When I started doing porn, I realized, oh my God, there's so much that I can do. This, like these sensations are incredible. I'm meeting cool people. Um, so that was really important to me. Also, I never threw my veterinary career away. I was working as an emergency vet up until I left to come here. And the only reason why I'm not still doing it here is because my visa allows me to only be a performer. Otherwise, I would be doing it. Um, I'm actually sitting the exams for America this year or next year. I'm doing all the prep at the moment. So the ultimate goal is if I, if America allows me to down the track, I will still do both, but probably just through a volunteer aspect more so than anything else. Um, and I, I just... I mean, I've always been a really creative person. I always was the artsy girl at school um, and I find a lot of creative outlet in producing just as much as performing. So I started pretty helpful ever. I, I uh, worked as a performer for a small company and it was well, not so small of a company, Girls Out West in Australia, which is arguably the only um, established company in Australia and then I worked over in Europe couldn't get to America and I was like okay I want to shoot more how am I going to shoot more fuck it I'm going to open my own company so mm. then I started my own company um, hired staff and we worked for three years like that with me working as a veterinarian 30 hours a week night shift and then running my production company and shooting on the days off as well wow it was a lot I don't yeah. recommend <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, how did you like, so did you find that there was any conflict between your veterinary job and your adult performing job? Not just like the hours, but like socially, did you experience any stigma? So I was outed to my first job kind of inadvertently by myself. I was discriminated against by a bank and an article got written about it in the Daily Mail that went viral. And I had five different work colleagues see the article and come to me and saying, hey, but people are talking about this. You might want to tell the bosses. So I had to sit down with my bosses and have that awkward conversation. And um, my blessing is one, I had incredible bosses. I, I never had to worry with either of the clinics that I worked in whether I would still have a job because of it. Um, but Vet, the veterinary industry has to take care of its vets quite heavily. And I think that was also my blessing. Vet, vet industries don't have the luxury of discriminating against their vets because there's hardly any of them as it is. Hmm. Our suicide rates are six times the national average. Wait, what? Yeah. Uh, 50% of vets will leave within five years of graduating because it's just so demanding. The hours, people screaming at you, having to deal with death and euthanasia constantly, mm. night shift, um, you know, I, lo I love emergency work, but I understand why people do it. You know, once a month we would get an email saying, Vale, doctor, blah, blah, took their own life. So um, I think clinics would have been crazy to discriminate against me or, you know, introduce that stigma into my workplace as a vet. Because the way I look at it and the way they looked at it is as long as it's not affecting my clinic, who cares? Right. You know, like what's the point? The doesn't, animals aren't going to object to yeah, you treating them. <laughs> it doesn't change my brain. It doesn't change what knowledge I have as right. far as how to fix an animal or how to save a life. Um, it's completely separate. And I never had anyone, thank God, <laughs> recognize me at the clinic or say anything. Mm -hmm. So um, I was very lucky that I got, I was very privileged to live both lives at yeah. the same time. You know, it's so interesting to me that you're saying that about the suicide rates with veterinarians because, you know, one of the many untruths that I see, you know, stated as fact on in my YouTube comments on social media, wherever, is that the uh, suicide rate in adult through adult performers is through the roof, which is not true. Yeah. We did have a time period where there was a lot of like high profile suicides within like a year. Yeah, I remember um, that period. Yeah, which was terrible and tragic. We lost some amazing people. And some of those were accidental overdoses. But when you look at like the the size of the adult industry in general and and you know, especially now, like with OnlyFans, you know, there's a lot of like content creators that don't necessarily do professional porn, but they're doing porn at home. Like mm. if you look at the numbers of the people who have committed suicide versus like how many they're in there, like this idea that like most adult performers die from suicide or drug overdose is like laughably wrong. And yeah. I don't know who's spitting these statistics out, yeah. but they're insane. And so it's crazy for me to hear you say that, you know, that there's such a high suicide rate in the veterinary industry because 
nobody's going to say, well, then you shouldn't be a vet. I know. You know what I mean? Like the vet that's going to destroy you and you're, you know, all these veterinarians, they yeah. all kill themselves. So <laughs> yeah. clearly like, you know, it, but it is like damaging in a way. And I guess the argument would be the emotional toll that being a veterinarian takes is, you know, because you're trying to help people and help animals and not being able to do that has got to be really hard. Whereas obviously sex work has not seen in the same heroic light, which I totally understand. Yeah, I think SWERFs have a lot to answer for the attitudes of, of the public and and how we're sometimes perceived. Uh, luckily, as a vet, there's not a group of people going around being like, you shouldn't be a vet. You know, how <laughs> dare you save that dog's life? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I get to escape it there a little bit. Yeah. Um, but, I, yeah, it's a ridiculous um, social construct or I guess way of looking at our industry yeah um but so so back to you know getting into adult okay so so you're were you in school for veterinary medicine or were you actually a vet when you decided to start performing I just graduated you just graduated okay yeah. so tell us about like your first experience shooting adult like was it solo was it Girl, girl, boy, girl, like what was it like? So it was for Abby Winters. Um, I was going to ask about them because I know that they're yeah. like a really big company over there. Yeah, well, they're, I think they shoot more in Europe now okay. um, because they struggled to get people to um, video for them in Australia. Mm -hmm. The market's just entirely different. Mm -hmm. um, but I flew up to Brisbane and it was all solo stuff and I remember being terrified <laughs> and I remember getting naked for the first time for like they do this like body check that I've not done in America but I kind of understand it where they go over your body to look for marks and to look for lesions that could although it was odd because it's a solo so what does it matter but looking for lesions for STDs and things like that and I remember being like wow this is really what I'm, I'm going down this road cool okay yeah let's give it a crack but I didn't um feel violated it was very um I don't know if empowering is the right word because I think I was so new and so it was so overwhelming that I think it I couldn't I didn't have the ability to feel empowered per se at mm -hmm. the time but I finished and I was like you know what this was this is fine this is great this was fun yeah this felt amazing so let's keep exploring this and see where I end up yeah I mean I think it's okay for that feeling of empowerment if that's what you um you know uh, feel to come later because yeah. you're right. Like the first time is just, it's a lot just to get through it. I think the empowerment comes later when you find that there's a lot of opportunities yes. that the adult industry can provide you. I mean, you went on to start your own business. Yes. I mean, that's, you know, something that's not as easy to do in under industries. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Um, and that was so difficult to do, especially in Australia because Australia has very bizarre laws compared to America as far as porn. So, um, Obviously, here you can shoot porn. I, it used to be illegal, but now you're allowed to. In Australia, it's legal to shoot, but it's illegal to distribute. Mm -hmm. Our classification system really um, fights the, our ability to be able to shoot. And so I won't give away all the secrets as to how we managed to run a company in Australia just in case I bring the wrath of, <laughs> I don't know, Australian governments yeah. on me. But um, there are ways around it, and I just managed to figure out how to get around it um, with the help of some much smarter people than me. Yeah. And I was just very good at building my team with people who knew more than me. Yeah. So that they could hold my hand through the process. Yeah. I mean, the, the porn laws are also a little bit funky here too. So the yeah. only reason that it's technically legal to shoot in California is because of the Freeman case, which was back in, I think, the early 80s. I know my parents were shooting when that happened because yeah. when my parents started shooting, it was I wouldn't say technically illegal, but it had never really been like challenged in the courts. And so the Freeman case... It came up and and it was ruled that it was it was not because they were trying to argue that it was pimping and pandering. Yeah. But basically it was prostitution. Yeah. And they lost that case. Yeah. And so um so porn became technically legal in California. And then I believe um why am I not thinking of the state on the East Coast that adopted that case? Minnesota's in my head, but it ain't Minnesota. <laughs> it's the place that Bernie Sanders was like governor of Vermont. Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you. I know no American wow. states. People are like, yeah, I'm, I'm real smart. Um, and then, um, so, but in the other states, it's not like illegal, but it's not like legal. Yeah. So it's like this weird little gray area. Gray area. <laughs> yeah. It's really strange. And for us, it's especially weird because, um, 
we've had like this massive push for decriminalization in Australia recently with sex work, sex mm. work in general, which has been excellent. Um, you know, it, Australia or New South Wales, which is a state in Australia, was the, fir- the first place in the world to decriminalize sex work about 27 years ago. I was going to say, because there is a part of Australia where escorting prostitution is I guess not legal, but decriminalized. So Australia is really unique in that it's the only country where it's decriminalized, legalized, and illegal, mm. depending upon what state you're in. Mm-hmm. So New South Wales did it first 27 years ago, and then we had Northern Territory do it in 2019, I think it was. And then I was a part of the push for Victoria in 2022. Mm-hmm. And it was like meeting with parliamentarians to talk to them about my my life because, unfortunately, um Being a vet and a sex worker, it's much easier to sell to a parliamentarian than just being a sex worker. Right, right. Um, And then Queensland passed it in April this year. So we're just on this big run of decriminalizing, but porn is still in this kind of weird space. Yeah. Yeah. So you said that there it's decriminalized, it's legal, and it's illegal, depending on the area. So right? South Australia is the only place where it's illegal. Mm-hmm. Still, they tried to pass decrim a few years back and it got denied. Mm-hmm. Um, that It's our church state. It's kind of like probably the equivalent in America of somewhere like Texas, but mm-hmm. a little less radical, I guess. But um, I think it will be the last state to fall in the mm-hmm. domino effect. Um, and then... Um, Queensland used to be legalized and the, uh, the rest of the states are legalized. But legalization, all it really is is a form of criminalization because you're saying you can work but only if you do it the way that we want you to you're still criminalizing people if they don't follow xyz and what all of our government is coming to realize is there are ways that you can be you know you can protect the public under health acts under business laws you know it doesn't have to be its own thing Mm -hmm. and that was the point of decrim was to treat us like an actual business instead of a whole other sector right yeah and that's what i was kind of like pushing towards you answering was because a lot of people don't understand the difference between decriminalization and legalization. Yeah. And legalization means regulation, yes. which can be problematic. Yes. Um, especially, you know, with the government and their archaic ideas about sex work and porn. So generally advocates prefer decriminalization to legalization. Yes. And decrim is not necessarily perfect when it comes to governments. Like in an ideal place, yes, everything would be decriminalized because it removes that stigma and it increases the ability to go to the police. But um, some of the states that passed decrim still kept, um, they kept street work, for example, illegal. So Mm -hmm. there's some caveats there. It's not a perfect system, but it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. That's all we can ask of them at the moment, I guess. Yeah. Baby steps. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, what about your family? Um, are you close to your family? Do they know what you do? Yeah, well, my family knows. Um, I was very strategic <laughs> when I came out to my family. I have an auntie who's probably my best friend, and um, she, she's lived the craziest life. She's been a professional gambler, and now she does kinesiology. But she, I remember having a conversation with her once when I was younger where she said, oh, when I was younger, I wanted to open up a knock shop with Emma, my best friend. So I knew that she was- A what shop? A knock shop a brothel oh okay (laughs) I'd never heard that term before (laughs) I don't know if it's an Australian term or not um so I knew she would be fine with it and I started with her and then trickled my way down the line of who was most likely to be fine with it until I got to the the end people and by then they didn't really have the chance to be not okay with it because everyone else was Mm -hmm. I was very strategic Interesting. And um, I think as more time has gone on, the more supportive they've become and the more they've understood the decisions that I've made. Mm -hmm. And um, they're happy for me, which I'm very blessed because I understand that there are a lot of people out there who don't have that experience. Yeah. Which is horrible. Yeah. I I find that the people that I see who struggle the most with mental health issues in this industry are people who've been cut off from their family or don't have, like, that support from their roots. It's really, really sad. Yeah. And I think that this industry can be very overwhelming to anyone and so you need a good social network to support you through that, like, transitional period of getting to know the industry and know yourself as well because, let's be honest, you know, coming into this industry teaches you a lot about yourself as well. Yeah. Um, And I think for sure it makes sense that, the people that you come across struggle more if they don't have that family yeah. support. Yeah. yeah um, it's interesting because that does make me think of Spiegler and you are a Spiegler girl. So for those of you who don't know, if you're new to my podcast, Mark Spiegler is um, probably one of the most respected agents in our industry. 
Uh, and does he still do Spiegler Thanksgiving? I think so. I've heard about it. I, I've not had Thanksgiving yet. Oh, okay. So I'll find out this year, but I think so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was like, it's kind of one of those um, industry like legend, you know, yeah. where he, so Spiegler would have like a big Thanksgiving at his house for basically all the porn performers who didn't have a family to go back to or couldn't yeah. fly home for Thanksgiving and it would be like this big like. Which is so sweet because I do that for Christmas. I Because I lived in Melbourne but my hometown was Brisbane in Australia. Mm -hmm. I would do an orphan Christmas every year. We didn't do Thanksgiving but I would do an orphan Christmas and anyone who didn't have somewhere to go would come to my place and we would just have Christmas together which is really sweet. Yeah. So I'm excited. I'm really glad that he does it because yeah. I think otherwise – it would be very it would be a very isolating feeling i think yeah at that time of year how has it been being with mark do you feel like cuz i mean you know he you know got sick and he kind of stepped away for a bit and um i haven't been shooting professional porn for a while now so i haven't really been talking to his agency but i know he's not as involved as he was at one point um so is there still like that that like family sense of community like being a speaker girl does that still mean the same thing that it meant before? Yeah, I think I, I feel so. I, I respect him incredibly and he's taken really good care of me. There have been some people that have hit me up and asked me if I'm available for a shoot and I'll go to speak and he'll tell me if there's been problems or not. So I definitely feel a strong vested interest in looking out for my best interest from mm -hmm. him. And that's all I can really ask of him. Mm -hmm. But even though he's not as involved, I still hear from him all the time. Yeah. And I still go to dinner with him. And, you know, he, he definitely makes an attempt to get to know the people that he's looking after, which yeah. I think is a really special quality yeah. um, to have in an agent. He know? also, he also, um, I did actually see him on some shoots before I kind of stopped shooting. He, he also brings a whole box of pastries to set. If you book one of his girls, if he's in the area and has oh, time, gosh. which the I crew, haven't had that yet. Oh, you've had I, that I, yet? No, oh, I will wait. That. I've been oh. sending him pastries as a okay. thank you. So Mark, we'll... sorry. I outed you <laughs> the next set that Charlie's on. You need to show up with your pastries because she feels left out. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of like one of the things that like he's, he's known for so um, well it sounds like we're both peas in a pod then because I like every couple I remember maybe like two months into moving here I sent them pastries oh to be like thank you for looking after me oh and I really God, appreciate so you so I don't know maybe maybe it means we're two peas in a pod <laughs> I love that all right guys uh stick around we're gonna take a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back hey listeners let's briefly touch on a topic that we don't always talk about performance in the bedroom and you know how it goes, the minute you realize that you might be struggling, those thoughts just start swirling around in your head, making things even worse. Well, you can skip that anxiety ridden, will I be able to get hard voice in your head with Blue Chew. Blue Chew offers the first chewable tablets with the same FDA approved active ingredients that you would find in Viagra and Cialis. Whether it's a confidence boost or a little assistance you're after, Blue Chew can be a game changer. Now here's the cool part. The process is online, no awkward doctor's visits or pharmacy lines. Blue Chew's licensed medical providers will find the right plan for you and it gets delivered right to your door in a discreet package. And because you are a valued listener, I've got a special deal for you. Visit bluechew.com and use code HOLLY to get your first month for free. You just pay the $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com code HOLLY. Get out of your head and back into bed with Blue Chew. Hello, everybody. We are back. So, Charlie, one thing that you said before we took a break was that you learned a lot about yourself mm. from the adult industry. Can you elaborate on that a bit? I am a freak in the sack is what mm. I've learned. <laughs> and I am shocked at what my body can do. Like the, the human body is like fascinating and I didn't really get the chance to understand that until I got into porn and I got to start pushing my boundaries what can I do like literally yesterday was it yesterday or the day before I fisted my ass for the first time and I was so excited you have no idea I've been trying to do this for so long <laughs> everyone's gonna have goals people we all have dreams yeah and mine was that and I ticked it off now next stop is a man's hand but we'll get there eventually maybe a small man <laughs> Small man. Like a little, yeah, like, I, petite I petite guy. Like, maybe. I'm fine with, like, let's go hell for leather. Let's just <laughs> – but um, I, I rarely – I don't think I've ever said no to anything in particular. I'm always really prepared to 
at least try something. I want to try everything at least once and mm. see, see what it's like. Um, and um, I, yeah, I've learned that my body can do crazy shit and I love it. And um, I think as well it, it showed me how, I mean, I never really thought that I'd be like a business owner. I, like that was never when I was growing up. I actually wanted to be a veterinarian, so I did the whole dream degree. Like, you know, when you're three and you've got that thing you want to be. You know what's really funny about that but, is I was that person. So yeah. I wanted to be a vet when I was a kid, like most kids. And I, my mom had like the veterinary encyclopedia. Yeah. And I used to make myself read like a chapter every single day That's when so I was cool. like seven. I had no idea what I was reading. Yeah. This was also like an early indicator of how hard I can be on myself. And I would tell myself if, if I didn't like read that chapter, then I was never going to grow up to amount to anything oh and be a veterinarian. Like I was like, <laughs> you're rough. I was like very like hard on myself. I'm <laughs> like, you have to read this veterinary encyclopedia at the age of seven. Otherwise, you'll never be anything. Never be a um, and I did not become a vet. And I ended up in porn. So there you go. It's all because I didn't finish <laughs> reading the encyclopedia when I was seven. My dri- my life could have been so different. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, but uh, yeah. No, so yes, I I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I started to build my business, and um, because my experience up till then had been performing, and I had not produced up until then I was kind of surprised when I did it and I loved it I thought that I would want to just be the person involved with the the physical side of it Mm -hmm. like coming into it that's what I'd done and that was the fun part but I actually like producing is my jam I love it I Mm. love and editing finding music I'm my my editor back home and my co-producer Pash always says that I'm really good at my location scouting and my music and I you know I love that stuff. Two very important things, by the way, that I feel like a lot of people overlook. Yeah. Um, locations are everything. Yes. Scouting your location before you get there is so fucking important. Yes. I literally cannot tell people that enough. Like, I would never shoot at a location before I scouted it. Really? Never. See, I dice with danger. I love going in and no. not having seen it yet, and then we just work with what we've got. And sometimes the the ones that we've had to change because it wasn't perfect ended up being, like, some of our best videos. Like, one of our AVN-nominated videos we shot in the tiniest little bedroom you've ever seen and I never thought that it was going to be something that was going to be special enough to get an international AVN nomination and then that was the one it's always the 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 ones that you don't expect I feel like see it seems to me like you enjoy like that challenge I do not enjoy (laughs) I don't like surprises I don't like going into something thinking it's going to be one thing and it's not that thing yeah um, one of the honestly like my biggest thing about scouting a location first is meeting the owner yeah. Um, and scouting the neighborhood. Yeah. Like making sure that there's not a fucking like, you know, school yeah. next door with like kids playing outside, you know, like really yeah. big problems. Yeah. Uh, making sure the that, is yeah, like making really- sure the owner is not weird. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely had a couple of people who thought that they could just sit and like watch the scene mm. or they've tried to like hit on the model, you know what I mean? And I have to have that like one-on-one talk with them. I'm like, okay, you can't watch the scene. You can't talk mm. to the model. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I like to get Treat all them of like that. like a 10-year-old. Basically, yeah. just before we get there so I know that I'm not going to have, like, some terrible, awkward situation. Because the biggest issue that I have with producing, and I've been doing this for a long time, mm. is locations. It's not the fucking models. It's not the crew. It's yeah. not the lighting. It's not like, you know, she wasn't prepped for anal. All of these, like, things that people think it is. It's always a location. Yeah. Always. It's my biggest problem. But when you get it right, it's what makes it. Oh, yeah. Oh, when it's incredible. A great location is everything. And it's inspiring. It's like, yeah. I mean, it's all, for me, like, location is such a huge part of the puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm a big real estate bitch, so I just love scrolling through all the different platforms looking for places that I can shoot at next. And I kind of treat it almost as a holiday. Yeah. Sometimes I'll find really nice places and I'll just stay an extra night because why yeah. not? <laughs> Do you find issues, though, because, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm sure you encounter this, a lot of people are not okay with adult. Yeah. Um, it's definitely something that comes up. I think I've gotten my little – routine on how to initiate an owner into the possibility of a mm-hmm. shooting point in their place down pat I have a 50 50 hit rate mm. which I find is like pretty good when compared to when I talk to other people and I use a lot of platforms that other people have issues on mm-hmm. um I don't know I'm just really good at convincing people I think this. it helps being a woman yes. I found that 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 helps yes. I also have my little spiel where I'm like we are a female-led crew yes. and we do glamour and da, 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 and I send them samples of stuff I've done yes so and I often get that feedback of like this is 
not what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Like very, you know, impressed that yeah. it's not like, because people have this idea of what they think porn is. And some porn is like that. Yeah. But a lot of porn is not. Porn yeah. is so many different things. It's like the widest world. Yeah. And I think um, because there are a set number of companies that are so big that they almost dominate the market when you mm -hmm. look online, you forget that there's all of these tiny, smaller companies um, that are entirely different. And you can find something for everyone. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's stuff out there that you didn't even know exists as porn. Yeah. You know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So um, let's talk about some other differences between Australian porn versus American porn. What do you say are some of like the biggest differences between the two? Um, I've been asked this question a fair bit. I think it's when I say this, I don't mean that American porn is not necessarily authentic, but I think Australia, the way that Australian porn is created, because there's only one company really operating and then mine kind of started up and was involved for a while. Um, it's a country that's very heavily based on content creation mm -hmm. um, because there are no companies for people to work for, or very limited companies, and the main company doesn't shoot men. Um, so Is this Abby Winter? No, Girls Out West. Girls Out West, okay. Um, there are a couple of companies that were shooting men for a period and then they kind of like – um, cut back a lot and mm -hmm. then close for a period. Um, but because our whole industry is based on content creators more so, um, when you look at the porn that comes out of Australia, I find it to be authentic in the sense that um, it's they're not aiming necessarily for like a big production camera and they're not exposed to that world of production. And um, it's a little more stripped back and a little more naked. And um, I think there's something really special with that type of sex and capturing that on camera. Not to say that the big glitzy videos that you see that come out of America are not important and are not amazing to watch and they can also be very authentic, but it's a very different feeling. Like mm -hmm. it's a it's a very intimate kind of vibe. And I think that's probably the best way I'd define Australiana porn versus mm -hmm. the rest yeah. of the world. No, that makes sense. I think especially, you know, with porn produced here in LA, like with this is Hollywood, right? So you're going to have – a lot of people like who come in from film school that are yeah. like, you know, using this as a stepping stone to get somewhere else and a lot of a lot of that. So these people are going to be pushing like the more professional, glitzy, glamour, maybe less authentic kind yeah. of. Yeah, I feel that. And I remember my first time shooting here in America because uh, previously I'd been used to my team, which was my makeup artist, my videographer, myself, and whatever model I was going to have for the day. So it was like a team of four people or five mm -hmm. people. And then one of my first shoots was with Vixen <laughs> with like their 15-person team or however many crazy numbers of people there were. Yeah. And I just remember walking around being like, oh, my Lord, like yeah. this is insanity. Yeah. Um, I had so much fun, but it was such a different feeling. Even. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, you know, when you're like, wow, this is like a real – movie set. Yeah. Of. Yeah. And yeah. all these people are going to be watching me fuck in a minute. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. It's not just my best friend and my makeup mm -hmm. artist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I find that that's a, luckily you don't have a penis because I find that that's usually yeah. guys' biggest problems, right? They come from these small shoots or they've been shooting stuff with their girlfriend on a webcam and then they come to set and there's all these people watching them and yeah. the performance anxiety is like through the roof. And I don't blame, I don't know how male performers do it. I just, Dude. I take my hat off to them. They deserve right, gold medal every time they step on set. Same. That's what, and they're it's so valuable. They're so valuable too. Like the good ones. That's why they're booked all the time. Yeah. Well, and in Europe especially, it's even crazier. Like the guys. Like I hate to break it to everyone, but cum shots aren't always real. <gasps> oh my god! Get out of here! No. <laughs> but in Europe, when I would leave, <laughs> I would see the boys like getting syringes without a needle on of Gaviscon and they put it up their urethra so then when they stroke it, the Gaviscon comes out so it gives it this added realism but they'd be like, it burns, quick, let's get this over and I'm like, how are you doing this? Okay, like, I have crazy. to say I've literally never, we've never done that and I've actually never heard of guys yeah. doing that. I've shot, I used to shoot in Europe like once a year um, and I've never seen that but that's, that's some dedication. It was super common. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I just, yeah, I... I don't think I could do it. Yeah, because worst case scenario, like what I've had to do is usually if you have to fake a cum shot, you'll do like a fake cream pie because that's the mm -hmm. easiest thing to fake because then you can just shove like the spunk lube. It looks like the most like cum up the girl's vagina and then the guy can like stick his dick in and then you can roll and then he can pull it out and like 
you know, he can pretend he came because you don't see the pop shot, right? Yeah. You just see the aftermath. Yeah. Um, the aftermath. <laughs> <laughs> it <laughs> is an aftermath yeah. most of the time. <laughs> so that's the easiest thing to to fake yeah. if you have to fake a cum shot. Otherwise, you have to do like this like off camera with the big syringe and then just like psh, yeah. <laughs> shoot it on her tits or her face. And and that almost never looks real. Or sometimes uh, you bring in a stunt cock yes. um, if there's a penis available that looks similar to the penis in the scene. But that's almost – I don't think I've ever done that. But I've never I've, seen it, but I've heard about it, and I think it's crazy. Yeah. 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 I will say, like, there was – so Brad Armstrong was a big director for Wicked, and he used to sometimes do um, – he used to always be tested yeah. in case he had to come in and do the pop shot oh, in case, wow. like, he was shooting a movie because he was a performer yeah. before he was a director. Um, and he would come in and he would do the fake pop if wow. the guy – or the real pop, I guess, just different yeah. penis – if the guy couldn't do it. So he was always tested, like, literally specifically for that reason so he could come in. That's, and- that's great, though. That's perfect. That's <laughs> perfect. I remember once um, shooting an anal scene here, and um, the, the poor the poor videographer just forgot to press record for the pop <gasps> shot. Oh, and that is like every fucking <laughs> videographer's worst nightmare is yeah. not pressing record on the pop shot. Yeah, there was some swear words, and then we were like, okay, let's rally and redo this. But you're trying to, like, move your body like you're being fucked, and yeah. then some poor person is trying to, like – aim a uh, like syringe up your butt while you're moving it was just like a shit show <laughs> but it, we did it <laughs> it's those moments where you're just like what is this thing that I do for a living this yeah. is the stupidest job it's like ever trying to play pool with a wet noodle trying to like <laughs> aim it in the moving hole <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely like <laughs> been in the kitchen trying to whip up something that looks like cum because like we don't have anything like Cetaphil or Spunk Lube and I'm like putting sugar and flour and water. I'm yeah. like, does that look like cum? And I'm like putting it on my face and I'm like, no, no. more flour. <laughs> it's just lumpy and it like doesn't stick right. Oh, Jesus. You know what the craziest lube is actually that I have ever heard of mm. from so I used to well I still do I cam quite a bit mm-hmm. and I remember a guy taking me into like the private room of the cam world mm-hmm. and he just wanted to show me him fisting himself in the ass and I was so excited I got to watch this dude fist himself for like 15 minutes and he finished and I was like oh my god because I was trying to train myself to do that at the mm. time I can do it now so it's fine but I was like how teach me all the secrets and he said not Alex and, and I was like, sorry. And he was like, get margarine. Margarine is like the best lube for your butt. And so I went away. And so delicious too. I went away and I tried it. And when I when I say that my hand went further than it's ever gone previously, I'm not kidding. It was the craziest. It didn't move. It was the perfect consistency. So are we doing like real margarine or like will – Thank God it's – or I can't believe it's not butter. Like, I will think, that work? I think any of them will work. But whatever – I remember trying – it's cool. I don't know if you have nut Alex here, but it's like a nut um, – it's like a margarine basically. And okay. It was like the best anal loop I've ever used. It's like a nut butter? Yeah. It was cool. It was fun. Yeah. Wow. you really slippery. Interesting. That's what I should have used when I was trying to fist myself the other day. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so many more opportunities stand before you, though. I know. And and think of, I mean. Now I can give margarine to the guy that, I want, that I'll get to try and fist yeah. me at some point. And, and then you can, it. like, lick it afterwards and it'll be, like, delicious. Yeah. Maybe put some jam on top. Yeah. Way better. Then- <laughs> I, I ate cake out of my ass for my birthday in April. <laughs> and, um. It was nice to eat food, like, <laughs> that tasted really good. Although I don't recommend Jello because Jello melts in your asshole. I can say that. <laughs> you mean, okay, wait, do you mean gel? Jello. I mean gel. Uh, like, do you mean je- like, jelly? Yeah. Because Jello and jelly are different. Oh, are they? Yeah. Okay. Jello's like, is that, that, stuff that jiggly you s- yeah, that. stuff? Okay. Yeah, that melts in your butt. Oh, Turns into liquid really fast. I bet. It looks like I'd murdered someone in my butthole because we were using like raspberry jello. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not the red stuff. No. But I can vouch for using food based items in my butt. So I'm 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 happy to sign up to the Nutalex margarine thing. <laughs> You're all welcome, by the way, for that sex tip. You can go home and enjoy the best anal of your life now oh with God. absolute comfort. <laughs> Um, speaking of sex tips, uh, one thing that I do like to ask female performers is what do you think is, what are guys doing wrong in the bedroom? Like what can men do to improve 
their abilities as a lover? I think the number one thing is not forgetting that she also still has to come and your dick is probably not going to be the thing that gets her to come. Mm. Because most women can't come from just penetration. I'm one of those people, by the way. Yeah, I'm one of them as well. Like I need clitoral stimulation as well as penetration and there are some days where it can take me a while to come, for Mm -hmm. sure. Like Mm -hmm. sometimes I'm five minutes, sometimes I'm 30 minutes. It can Mm -hmm. vary a lot and sometimes I'm multi-orgasmic and sometimes I'm not. But I find with my lovers in the past... Well, some of them, um, they'll you'll fuck and they'll come and then they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, they're like, was that good for I'm you, like, babe? And you were like, yeah, it's great. Great, yeah, cool. You have fingers. Get in there, buddy. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> put them up there. So, do you like being finished. fingered? Because some women don't. Here's another thing too that I've found that um, a lot of guys don't necessarily understand is not every woman's the same. Yes. And some like fingering. Some don't. I actually don't like fingering. Anytime I'm with a woman, I ask her what she loves first. Mm. I think that's also the other thing that they need to do is to ask what gets them off because every woman knows what their best triggers are. Yeah. There are some women out there that haven't come or don't really know what their triggers are or whatever, and that's fine, but they'll at least be able to tell you what they don't like. Right. Um, And so you got to start there. Yeah. Um, But I love fingers. I can be fisted by women. I love... As long as you use margarine. (laughs) I don't know about margarine in the pussy. It could be a whole other thing. Oh, could you imagine? I don't know. I mean, (laughs) you can. (laughs) You're the expert here. I don't don't know about margarine in the pussy. I feel like. (laughs) Maybe yeast infection. Yeah, bacteria might not love that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And the ecosystem is much more fragile there than the butt. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. this is true. Yeah. (laughs) Um, What about penis size? Do you have an ideal penis size? How important? is penis size to you um my ideal penis size is a penis that I can play with and do things with and it doesn't necessarily have to fit in me like I don't have a favorite penis size per se I love anal so um when you start getting into like the bigger sizes I I can still fuck a big dick in my ass but I'm probably not going to do it every night per Mm. se but it doesn't mean that I can't do something with it I think there's something that you can do with any body even if you had a micro penis the stuff that you can do with a guy that'll still feel good to you. So I don't have an ideal penis. Mm. Cuz I think that get creative, guys. If you ever if if you can't find a way to work with what you've been given, then mm-hmm. you know, you you're not thinking outside the box enough. Yeah. I always say that the most important part of a man's penis is the person that's attached to it. Yeah. I love and that. I'm going to steal that. You're welcome. <laughs> I give you margarine. Yeah, you, you know, you gave me quote. butt butter and I'm just giving you like little pearls of wisdom. And yeah, I mean, you know, I do a lot of dick ratings on my OnlyFans. I'm yeah. sure you've probably done some of those yes. too. And, you know, though one can admire a beautiful penis, it's it's honestly like so much more about the guy that's attached to it. I think I especially for women, you know, because we're not necessarily, you know, visual yes. people. We're, we're more about like the feelings. Yes, yeah. And, you know, the way a guy talks to you, the way he whispers in your ear, the things that he says. Like, for me, like, the biggest turn on is auditory. Yes. Like, what a guy says to me. Yeah. You know? I, I'm I'm very much auditory as well as a sensation, like, um, hot breath on my ear. It yeah. me every time. Back of my neck and back of my shoulders will destroy me. Yeah. Like, I can't, I can't like, not... Like, and most of my life I had not seen guys – I mean, the most I'd ever dated someone was five times until recently when I found myself kind of exploring more when I moved to America because now I have a life and I'm not mm-hmm. working 60 hours a week. Mm-hmm. And I found that the more I got to know someone just by virtue of knowing that person and knowing them as a human being, like I come like every single mm-hmm. – like multiple times, yeah. Yeah, the comfort level is huge. Like yeah. it's, it's definitely for me. I can come more frequently with somebody I feel comfortable with. Yeah. If I don't feel comfortable with you, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes sense. Though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned that you love anal. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about your anal prep. Um, I believe in another interview you talked about how porn anal prep is overkill if you're doing that for your personal life. Yes. So what's the line that you draw between the two and how do they differ? So I think in porn you're at the mercy of payment processing gateways that don't allow you to show crap um so um it we kind of have to clean out in order to help companies meet the criteria to allow them to sell videos right Mm -hmm. but in my personal life I rarely clean out like I I my body 
usually like 90% of the time it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And I remember a while back on Twitter seeing a guy who was like a daddy to um, – uh, another dude and he was kind of shaming him for having not been super clean when they did anal and I just remember thinking how fucking dare you like yeah. you're, you're sticking something in a butthole it's designed to shit yeah you can't shame someone for that stuff but the vast majority of time I don't have issues so I like I guess it is a comfort thing some people obviously are going to feel really uncomfortable about shitting themselves in front of someone else and mm-hmm. that's understandable but my experience is that um you don't need to be as panicked as mm-hmm. you, as a lot of people are and you don't need to stress as much as you think you need to and mm-hmm. you don't have to sit there for an hour cleaning out your butt if you don't want to, you know, like it's you can have just, I mean, anal sex is going to feel great whether you have or not and mm-hmm. I think people need to take a breath with that. Mm. Just because porn doesn't show it doesn't mean that it can't happen. Right, right. And, you know, porn is also a fantasy. Exactly. You know, we generally don't show, like, the lube being applied or, like, taking water breaks or anything like that. But all of those things happen. I talk about porn like it's kind of like Netflix. Mm -hmm. So you can go to Netflix and you can watch a documentary that shows you what the world is like and you can learn from that. Or you can go and watch Spider-Man. And when I finish watching Spider-Man, I don't sit there thinking that I'm going to, like, you know, hang off the ceiling from spider webs from my fingers. And porn is the same. There is the educational documentary type routes. There's the porn that is very um, conscious of showing real sex and showing the lube and showing. But then there's the rest of it, which Mm -hmm. is the fantasy world. And there's nothing wrong with creating a movie that delves you into fantasy right it's it's not the enemy just because it doesn't show it right absolutely and I get frustrated sometimes when you hear about people talking about ethical porn in the sense of it has to show all of those little things that would that happen behind this I don't think it necessarily has to in order to be ethical I think that's a terrible definition of being ethical yeah and that's also suggesting that like porn also has to be sex education which it's not at its core yes there is some porn that that is educational like you mentioned but overall it's a form of entertainment that's why it's called the adult entertainment industry yes. and I think you know people who come into porn you know watching it thinking that this is like what sex is like and this is like you know the learning from that is like that's that's scary because and it's also scary too because i don't know what australia is like but our sex education here in america is terrible yeah. there's only like 13 states that are required to teach it yeah so i um i delved into your situation with sex education recently here because I was asked to be a part of a a panel Mm. um, and I was asked to talk specifically about sex education and 40% of your schools don't even use your national sex education curriculum Mm -hmm. like um, at all and then the vast majority of the rest of them they don't have the resources to do it properly and they don't have people who are prepared to teach it after hours or you know for no extra pay and it's just a bit of a hot mess but Mm. Um, I think it's unfair to place the responsibility of teaching children on an entertainment industry. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There are so many other avenues where that can be controlled. Yeah. And we're not it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's up to the parents. And a lot of parents don't want to hear that. But as a parent no. myself, like, I recognize that it's up to me to teach my daughter about sex, not, you yeah. know, the industry. Yeah. So, I mean, she's two, so it's too early for that. But, you know, at yeah. some point, like, those conversations have to happen. Yeah. And not to get into that whole thing because that's a whole other conversation, but there are, like, various stages of growth where you're supposed to introduce certain concepts because, like, a kid's not going to get it all at mm-hmm. a certain age, but it's, like, it's a it's an evolution and it's a consistent learning process and you tell them as much as is appropriate for their age. Exactly. So when you look like at that. the national curriculum, they say in kindergarten you start by saying it's inappropriate for a stranger to touch you. Mm-hmm. Like, it's as simple as that. Sex education doesn't have to be, like, balls to the walls <laughs> yeah. from, like, the beginning. It's a, it's a gradual introduction. Yeah. Um, but... You know, I, I I personally, this is something that I've wanted to do for a long time and I hope that one day I'll have the people around me to be able to do it, but I want to make a website where um, it, like, divides up sex education by ages and if parents feel uncomfortable about teaching their kids, which is very common and mm-hmm. very understandable, flick them to the website, let them look at the stuff there. Um, mm-hmm. And then it also takes the onus off the schools as well then because the schools don't have the resource, resources to set something like that up. Yeah. So that's on my bucket list. I'd be surprised if it, that does that not exist now. There's there's some educational resources I think it can do with being collated into mm-hmm. one place. 
Yeah. For sure. Yeah, definitely. And I don't think there are any, as far as I'm aware, that start as young as what the curriculum says. I don't think I've ever seen a sex ed website that talks about how to teach a kindergartner and what to teach a kindergartner versus yeah. the next age groups. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that I, I mean, I, I don't either. The only thing that I know, um, you know, at this stage is to teach, it's it's actually better if you teach your kids the real names for their body parts rather than like making up cutesy names for yes. it so that they, you know, have an understanding of what things are actually called and not like, you know. Your poo-poo's. Yeah. Whatever, whatever people use. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, like we say vagina and butt and like, you know, all of those things, like things that are, you know, and there's no like weirdness around it. Yeah. I think it's when you create like a strangeness around it, you know, like, oh, don't talk about those things. Because kids are just like, they're just exploring their bodies. And they'll absorb that shame. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Yeah, totally, totally. This went down a random tangent. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What do you think is the biggest difference between porn sex and real sex? I think porn sex is still super enjoyable, but I always talk about how I'm not just fucking my co-star. I'm fu- I'm fucking a third person in the room, which is the viewer, mm. which is the camera. So That's a really good way to put it. Yeah. So when I'm having sex, I'm not just thinking about the person in front of me. I'm also thinking about making sure the other person can see. Am I open up enough that they can see what's happening? Am I talking in a way that they're also going to enjoy? Am I including them in the video? You know, is this position going to look good for them? So mm-hmm. I always have that third person in the back of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, there's not a big difference for me. Like my my personal sex life is very similar to my porn sex life, except okay. for the fact that I'm being aware of someone else in the room. Okay. Are if, if someone's new to you, um, they've just, just watched this podcast, they've just discovered you, they think you're adorable, um, where would you direct them to see maybe some of you think your best work out there right now? Um, so my website, charlieford.com, is the best place to go. Okay. Um, so that's where all of my professional videos for my site have been put and all my AVN nominated ones are. We're in the middle of rebranding it at the moment. I'm about to lose my brain with it. <laughs> um, but it's really exciting. Um, and, um, yeah, that's probably the best place. But we're also we have non a non-exclusive distribution with the vast majority of the large um, distribution sites like Adult Empire and Pink Label and La Cinema and Cheeks and you know all of them. So we're pretty. We get around. We're pretty easy to find. You mm. don't have to hunt hard to find us. Any scenes with any particular performers that you really love? Like, is I, I don't want to ask you like who's your favorite performer to work with because mm. that's such a hard question to answer because yeah. there's a lot of great. I personally hate that question when yeah. people <laughs> ask me that. But ha- what recent? Um, collaborations have you done that stick out in your head that oh, you thought were great? Easy question. There was one that I saw the trailers just starting to pop out for recently. It's for Evil Angel. Um, Pat Mine shot it with Chris Diamond. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just the craziest sex of my life. Hmm. And that boy has a big penis as well. Like it's not, sh- it's not shying away from life. Mm-hmm. And um, it was just there was a lot of chemistry and connection between us, but I was also being railed so hard and it was so overwhelming that like the scene fin. Oh, and he came in my eyes. The cum shot was coming in my eyeballs. I just like kept them open. And wait, wait. He oh, came oh, in my whoa, eyes. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Hold on. Yeah. This was on purpose. Yeah. Have you ever had cum in your eye before? I mean, I've had it accidentally before, but so I never you know purposely. How, you know how much it hurts. It doesn't hurt me. That's the weird what? thing. What? It doesn't uh, dude, help. I got cum in my eye once <laughs> and it like it uh that was excruciating. Yeah. My eye like swelled shut. It was horrific. Maybe my I don't know, my eyes seem to love it. Any and also Maybe I think Chris just has like magical cum. Probably. That's like I would really believe clean. that. Also, I think both eyes, I think when I get it in one eye, I can feel the difference more, but both eyes, it all felt the same. I couldn't see anything afterwards. It was all white. And I was just so overwhelmed because it was such a good sexual experience for me. I started crying at the end. So this this video is gonna come out and I just start like Did you cry the come out? Did that happen? It didn't go anywhere. I feel like the tears were cry to come out, bitch. The tears were trapped behind the cum, so I'll look like I'm crying, but I'm not crying because my face is covered with cum. Like I just what is happening? (laughs) It was the weirdest feeling. Wow, it was great. That's coming soon. (laughs) Coming soon to an eyeball near you. 
was nuts. Wow. Okay. So okay. So at the end, you're crying, but like, is it is it like happy a, tears? It's a happy. Can ha- you tell it's a happy cry? Cause... Yeah, because I talk about it. I was okay. like, that was the best experience okay. I've had in a long time, and okay. uh, probably ever. And okay. I don't think I'll ever repeat that. And Chris and I have like a cuddle, and it was really special. It was very special sex. It is very few things that can shock me. I feel a little bit shocked right now. And and I've me too as well, you know. And I've never cried after sex before. That's the yeah. first time in my life that I've been that emotional from what I just experienced that I just started sobbing like a little wow. baby. It was so nice. Yeah. Wow. So you held did you have to like hold your eyes open with your fingers or so he tried did, to, were you just like He tried to aim it in and like the first moment I I, you can't help it. I blinked because it's like going in there. But I just angled my head back more okay. and just dripped it on in there. Did yeah. you know that you – was it – It I'm was a spur su- of the moment decision. Wait. Okay. So who made this decision? I think him and I both uh, – he suggested it, but I was – I had the feeling he was going to go that way from the way that he was looking at me and he, the way he was poised over my eyeballs, it felt very different to like other people. So he he asked if he could do it and I said, yes, I'll do anything so yeah wow it was hot wow was the director just like what the fuck was that yeah I was like whoa that was nuts yeah there, I think it's it's one of my I, I I will go to my grave so happy having experienced that yeah wow, that's amazing that could have gone the other way too yeah. like yeah, thank god you were up for that well, but Chris and I have such good chemistry. Like yeah. we've shot together since for Pat again. Uh-huh. And there'll be another hectic I, – I don't know how much I should give away because the trailer's not out yet yeah. for that, but it's it's going to be just as crazy. Right. Like, there's just certain people that you yeah, get yeah, that yeah. extra spice with, and he's one of them for me. Do you know what the scene is called? Because I know people are going to be Googling this. Uh, I don't. Um, oh, it's Actually, it's under Evil Angels MILFs 3, I think it was called. You're a MILF? Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is coming up a lot in, um, in um, like, adult DVD talk, like all the forums and stuff I've noticed. And on Twitter, people are starting to be like, how do you keep being cast as MILF? And I don't mind it because it's a fantasy and it's a hot fantasy to be able to mommy talk um, someone. But I'm, I could get cast almost all the time as a MILF. And, I, yeah, I find that's my face as well when I first started getting it. Oh, wait, how old are you? 34. Okay, because you look so young. Yeah. I mean, you must know that. Like, yeah. you look, I thought you were 25. I've been told that, and it's my blessing. I hope it means that I'll have a nice long, because I came into this industry late, you know, like I started yeah. when I was 30. Yeah. So I'm I'm not coming in at 18 like a lot of the people here that are yeah. huge did. Um, and I think it's a blessing for me because I have the sexual maturity to do yeah. all this crazy shit and know who I am and know what I am and I'm not okay with, and then yeah. I look so are you grateful that you came in at 30? Like, do you think, because there's a lot of people that think that 18 is too young to get into porn. Yeah, I don't think I had the emotional maturity to deal with this industry before the age of 25. Mm-hmm. And even then it would have been a push. I think I really knew myself by 30. Mm-hmm. And I did a lot of discovering through porn as well, obviously. But um, I just think coming into it, I mean, also here's the thing, like people's brains aren't fully developed until they're 25. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember learning that when I, I was a physical therapist before I was a veterinarian. I've, mm-hmm. I've got the two degrees and I remember learning that. And so I don't think that I would have really coped personally. It's not to say that it's not the perfect choice for someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny, like when people talk to me about um, my job, if I say I'm just a porn star, I do get that stigma. But then if I come out afterwards with the vet thing, they're like, oh, it's fine because you're educated. In my head, I'm like, you don't need a piece of paper to be an educated person mm-hmm. and know what you want to do with your life. So um, there's there's no judgment towards people who come in at 18 or 20 and they know what they want to do and they take it by the balls, like good for them, but it wouldn't. I don't think I could have done it. Yeah, I think the biggest fear, and look, this definitely happens, you know, often is that, you know, people make uninformed decisions when they come into porn. They're like, they need money, they're in a yes. bad situation, or it looks glamorous to them, or... Mm-hmm. You know, they read Janet Jameson's fucking book, which, by the way, is like has been a lot of girls' stories. And they've come to really? be like, I read Janet Jameson's book and decided to get into porn. I was like, OK. Oh, wow. Um, and then they come in and they don't do their research. They don't know. They don't understand how to set boundaries. And that's where the problems come yeah, in. Yeah, for sure. I think then um, uh, you, you have to be really careful with how you handle people that are that young. And you need to be aware of all the things that they haven't even thought about, which mm-hmm. is so hard to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for sure. It's tricky. Yeah. yeah, especially because when you're 18, you think you know everything, and you but you don't, don't know shit. You don't know shit. Yeah, yet. yeah, you don't know who you are. You're just a little babe still. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for coming on. This has been an eye-opening <laughs> experience. <laughs> <laughs> and eye covering. <laughs> An eye opening, eye come infused, margarine, margarine. but experience. <laughs> wow. Uh, guys, go home and try it though, honestly. You're going to. Not the come in the eyes. Message she me. Doesn't, she doesn't mean no. that. She meets the margarine. Mean the margarine and, and then tell me how great <laughs> it was. <laughs> I would not recommend the come in the eyes. I have done that. Was Did not turn out so well for me. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, you know, you could be different. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media, please? Of course. Um, so you can find me under the Charlie Ford on Instagram, pretty much every other platform I'm Charles Ford. So C-H-A-R-L-S-F-O-R-D-E, TikTok, Reddit, you name it, I'm probably on it. And then my website, charlieford.com for my videos, if you're curious. Um, I, I don't know, like I, I get around, just Google my name. You'll okay. find it somewhere. <laughs> You okay. can backtrack from there. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, you guys can follow me on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall. Go to hollylinks.com for access to all of my content platforms. I've, I'm on everything. <laughs> um, and, of course, if you want to support this podcast and watch these interviews streamed live, as well as access bonus Q&A, my fine art photography, all that stuff, go to patreon.com slash Unfiltered. Thank you again, Blue Chew, for sponsoring this episode. Go to bluechew.com. Use code Holly for your first try sample for free. Um, just pay five dollars in shipping. Uh, thank you guys so much, and I will see you next time. Bye.